Living organisms are composed mostly of four elements, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, as we've just been talking about in this whole unit, with a little bit of phosphorus thrown in there for good measure in the nucleic acids. These are the basis for life's most important compounds, water, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. But there's a law in all of science. It's about the conservation of mass, matter, and energy. Mass, matter, and energy are never created, nor are they ever destroyed. Organisms cannot manufacture these elements, and they do not use them all up. So where do organisms get these elements? How does the availability of these elements affect ecosystems? Guess what? Get your papers ready, because we're going to find out. Remember, wide right, skinny left. See you on the next slide. On the first slide, I mentioned the law of conservation of mass, matter, and energy. Okay. This is a law that you're going to hear repeated over and over in biology as well as chemistry and physics. Matter moves through the biosphere differently than the way energy does. Remember, energy moves in one direction, from one trophic level to the next. Some energy dissipates into the environment as heat along the way. But while the Earth receives a steady supply of energy in the form of sunlight, constantly entering the biosphere, Earth does not receive a steady supply of new matter from space. Instead, matter is recycled within and between all the ecosystems. If you take a look at the picture on this slide and on page 79 in your textbook, it can help you remember that these cycles of matter are powered by this one-way flow of energy. Matter moves through the cycles and is transformed. It's never created, it's never destroyed, it's just changed or rearranged. Elements pass from one organism to another and to various parts of the biosphere in closed loops called biogeochemical cycles. So that's one big word that's got really three words crammed together, biological, geological, and chemical. So we call them biogeochemical cycles. And there are many ways they can be classified. Biological processes consist of any and all activities performed by living organisms, like the bear catching the fish and the digestion of the fish and all that kind of stuff. Eating, breathing, burning food, eliminating, eliminating wastes, all of these are biological processes. Geological processes include things like volcanic eruptions, weathering, erosion, movements within and below the surface of the earth. We see a beautiful picture of Bryce Canyon here showing geological processes and the island of Surtsey erupting. So those are all geological processes. The formation of clouds, precipitation, the flow of running water, and the action of lightning are examples of chemical and physical processes. Okay, so there's our biogeochemical. So we're going to be talking about all three of those as we go through this section. We're also going to be talking about human activity because human activity affects the cycles of matter on a global scale. These can include activities such as mining, burning fossil fuels, clearing land to build a farm, burning forests, or the manufacture and use of fertilizers. It even extends into our waters with drilling rigs and production platforms and barges and pipelines and all that stuff. These processes are vital to the cycling of matter, as you're going to see in the classroom activities with the carbon and the nitrogen cycle games. The same atoms and molecules are passed around again and again and again, but often in various different compounds. It's a never-ending cycle. So think about this. 
the carbon or nitrogen atoms or phosphorus atoms or the water molecules in your body today could have once been a part of a rock on the ocean floor or they could have been in the tail of a dinosaur or even a part of someone like Julius Caesar. Remember that matter is not created and it's not destroyed. It just keeps getting reused. And in order to get reused, it has to be recycled. So in the next few slides, we're going to talk about those processes. We're going to start with the water cycle because it's probably the most familiar to you and it's also the first one they talk about in the book. So in the water cycle, there are five main processes that we're going to consider. The first one is evaporation. Evaporation is the change of water from a liquid to a gaseous state. We see an example of evaporation here in this model over the ocean and there's some over the smaller body of, body of water as well. Water evaporates from all of those places and goes into the atmosphere. As the gaseous water rises in the atmosphere, the temperatures become cooler. And when the temperatures become cooler, water vapor can't stay in the gaseous state. So it starts to condense back into liquid and it forms bigger and bigger droplets of water. These bigger and bigger droplets of water condense and form clouds. You see condensation on windows when it's cooler on one side of the window than, than the other side. Okay, so water condenses, so condensation. We see that happening where the clouds are in this picture in the second little set of red circles. Water can also evaporate from the leaves of plants. This is called transpiration. And you see that in the fourth circle here. So water evaporating from the leaves of plants is called trans transpiration. Water also moves down through the ground. It's filtered by layers and layers of soil. This process is called percolation. And you see percolation all the way over there in the right hand corner in our last circle. It's again water moving down through the soil and being filtered by the layers and layers of soil. It's also a term you're going to hear in chemistry next year because it means in general the movement and filtering of a fluid. In this case water through layers of a porous material. In this case soil and rock. Lastly another familiar part of the process and something we've been seeing quite a bit of lately is precipitation. Yeah, so everywhere here where you see it snowing or raining or sleeting, we see precipitation. So the water that was raining on us today might have been water that was in a pool that dinosaurs drank from millions of years ago. Pretty cool. I hear the dogs barking. I gotta let them go in. Water is not the only material that recycles here in the biosphere. Carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus do as well. Remember, we don't have a new source of elements coming in from outer space like we do light energy. So all matter is just rearranged and used again and again. It's not created and it's not destroyed. Nutrients pass through these biogeochemical cycles moving carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus through the biosphere. Without these, life wouldn't exist. So let's take a look at the carbon cycle. Photosynthesis and respiration are reverse processes that either take in or give off carbon dioxide, as you might already know. Plants do photosynthesis, but animals and plants do respiration, putting carbon dioxide into the air. So photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide out and they use it to make their food which is also a carbon compound, but then at nighttime they undergo respiration, which they take in oxygen and give off carbon dioxide, just like we do. This is the bio part of the biogeochemical processes in the carbon cycle, and you see them circled in the two little circles labeled photosynthesis and plant respiration. Now, decaying organisms also put carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere as well. So we see that little circle there. This is where the detritivores and the decomp decomposers come in that we were just talking about in the last section. Humans have a part in this cycle as well as they do in all cycles. 
We burn fossil fuels, we run automobiles, we heat our homes, we generate electricity. This is the chemical part of the biogeochemical process. It's also human activity. Not shown in this model, but nonetheless important, is the geological part of this cycle. The geological part is volcanic activity. Volcanic activity releases tremendous amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This is carbon dioxide that's been trapped in rock and magma for millennia. So yeah, there's the carbon cycle. Now the nitrogen cycle is a little bit more complicated, so we're going to take two slides to kind of sort it all out here. So just kind of stick with me on this. It is pretty interesting if you ask me. 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen, but very little of it is of any use to living things as is. All living things need nitrogen. Do you remember why? We need it to make two things, amino acids for proteins and nucleotides for nucleic acids. Nitrogen occurs naturally in the soil as ammonia, NH3, nitrate ions, NO3, minus and nitrite ions, NO2 minus. Now you don't need to remember the formulas, you just kind of need to be familiar with the words that they're, that they're nitrogen compounds that occur in the soil. Okay? These compounds come from animal waste, from dead and decaying organic matter. Some dissolved nitrogen exists in the ocean and as we said, nitrogen gas is in the atmosphere. You see that noted with the little three little black arrows that we have here. Okay. Now, since 78% of the nitrogen is unusable, in order to recycle it, it needs to be made usable again. Okay. So what do you do if you have something that isn't usable and you want to use it again? You fix it. So nitrogen needs to be fixed. It gets fixed by reacting with hydrogen or oxygen. Lightning fixes some atmospheric nitrogen and bacteria in the soil and in the water fix still more. A third source of nitrogen fixation is in plants called legumes. Peas, soybeans, peanuts, and lentils are examples of legumes. Now, farmers might plant these crops. These crops take the unusable nitrogen in the soil and they make it usable again. And as I said, farmers might plant these crops. This is actually pretty critical because there are some crops like corn that are nitrogen hogs. They just deplete the soil of all the usable nitrogen stores in two or three crop cycles. Now, farmers usually don't want to spend additional money on fertilizer. So they can do one of two things in a situation if they have a field that doesn't have a lot of nutrient, has pretty poor soil. They can let the field sit fallow for one or two crop cycles and let natural soil bacteria work back up. Financially, this might not be a very good decision for the farmer though. So the farmer has another option. He can plant something like soybeans or alfalfa or peanuts because those crops put the nitrogen back, the good nitrogen back into the soil. This is called crop rotation and it's very, very common among farmers. We also have bacteria in the soil that obtain energy from the nitrates and the nitrites releasing nitrogen gas back into the atmosphere so that this cycle can start all over again. So if you study the diagram that we have here, which is also the same diagram that's in the textbook, you can see that the nitrogen cycle is predominantly a biological cycle. You see the cycle of nitrogen fixation and denitrification shown in the purplish blue arrows here. Fixation and denitrification by bacteria are the two main processes in the nitrogen cycle. And those are the words that I want you to be most, fam most familiar with. This happens in both soil and water and it, it goes from soil or water to the air and back. Okay, continually happening. Geologically, some nitrogen is put into the air with volcanic activity, but not very significant amounts. 
chemically some of the nitrogen atmospheric nitrogen is 